Good morning, and I want to welcome you all uh, to our um, CEO breakfast today. We have a very special guest, Joe Tucci. Do Joe, as you know, is uh, also a trustee at Northeastern. He is the uh, chairman and CEO of uh, EMC. But there is an aspect that I would like to focus uh, on here. Uh, we are in the middle of an enormous revolution that is changing the way we go about doing our work, whether it's in higher education or in healthcare. And very few people are able to ride this change, anticipate it, make bets on emerging opportunities, and shape the future of uh, this enormous revolution. And Joe is such a person. We we're talking this morning, even higher education is going to change dramatically by technology. And if you're not going to be ahead of it, you are going to disappear, no matter how good you are. And w the person who is going to talk today to us has another passion, and the passion is the Commonwealth and Boston. He, as you know, could have taken the, the company elsewhere, especially in terms of growth. He made a commitment to the Commonwealth and to Boston, and Boston and the Commonwealth are much better for that. I have to tell you that also to, a, a concrete example that happened recently. When we're working, when five universities uh, Harvard, MIT, BU, uh, the UMass system, and Northeastern. We're b working on the high, uh, high performance computing project that is now a reality. The person who really brought us together was Joe. If you bring five presidents of universities together in some room, you need either Joe or you need an angel. <laughs> so we had the Joe, and let me tell you, he's not an angel. That's for he sure. He is a true leader. He brought us together, and he made it a reality. So we're very excited to have our trustee, Joe Tucci, here with us today. And I'm going to ask Belinda to introduce him. Thank you. Two introductions. <laughs> Two introductions. Thank you, Joseph. Good morning. I'm Belinda Duran, a partner at Wilmer Hale here in Boston, and I co-chair our technology transactions and licensing practice working with high-tech uh, companies as well as life science companies. Um, Wilmer Hale has been a sponsor of the Northeastern CEO Breakfast Forum for the last 10 years, and we're delighted to have this opportunity on an ongoing basis to help business leaders come together to meet each other, um, share ideas, gain new perspectives. Um, and we're delighted today to be joined by our co-sponsors, Deloitte, um, and uh, the Massachusetts Business Roundtable. If you can hear me without the microphone, I'd probably prefer that unless there's a technical reason. Would you prefer I use the mic? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Prior to going to Harvard Law School, I worked in the high-tech industry for a number of years, developing computer-aided uh, engineering software in the local area, taking continuing education classes at Northeastern, and watching the rise of EMC Corporation over time. Um, and EMC has clearly grown rapidly, has become one of the success stories in Massachusetts, and has changed its business model from being a hardware-focused company building high-end uh, high storage systems to one that leverages cloud computing and uh, the virtual world to deliver IT as a service. And Joe, who we will have the honor for, of hearing from today, has really led that um, transformation of the company into one that now has 60,000 employees and $21 billion in revenue. Um, Joe Tucci uh, joined EMC in 2000, starting off as president and COO, um, moving into the CEO spot in 2001, and then um, adding chairman to his title in 2006. Um, the, uh, prior to that, he worked for six years at Wang Global, 
at first, uh, or as chairman and CEO, leading it out of its bankruptcy, which many of us recall, into a vibrant company that uh, had tremendous growth and then got acquired by Getronics. Um, Joe started his career in a number of positions in the high-tech industry, including as a systems programmer originally uh, with a BS from Manhattan College. Um, and he has an MS in business policy from Columbia University. Um, and as has been noted, he's an active member of the community, um, both on the board of trustees of Northeastern University, but chairman um, of VMware Corporation, as well as on the board of directors of Paychex Inc., uh, on the board of overseers of Columbia Business School, board of advisors of the Carroll School of Management at Boston College, board of overseers for the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and on the advisory this board of Tsinghua University in Beijing. I'd like to welcome Joseph Tucci. Thank you. Somehow I think I got two introductions. I'm a lucky guy. I hate being behind a podium. Uh, let me uh, start by saying, I'm not gonna talk at, almost at all about EMC today. Uh, I want to talk about something, which, wait a minute, is this on? Okay, nope, there we go. Uh, I wanna, uh, but, I'll, but I do want to mention that we at EMC believe, we use a word to describe our relationship with North, Northeastern University and that is special. Uh, obviously, uh, the E in EMC is Dick Egan, the M is Roger Marino. So our two founders are graduates of, of Northeastern. There's two buildings, uh, each one dedicated at Northeastern. Uh, Dick always told me that his building is nicer. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have uh, over 100 co-ops. Uh, we, we're fortunate to have students that are co-ops in EMC. We, try, we hi try to hire as many of them as we can. We usually succeed in hiring at least half. So it's a very special relationship, and as Joseph said, I have the real privilege of serving on the board of trustees. So it's, so it's a really deep and special relationship. So Joseph, thank you, and uh, thank everybody else for having, having me here today. It's great to be with you. Uh, I think I'll set a, I want to talk, I'm going to talk about more about information technology today, about a shift, and we'll to, why I think this shift is tremendously opportunistic for us in Massachusetts. And of course, the seed of that opportunism will come out of the great universities like like Northeastern. But I think it's, I don't know if it's the key to productivity, but I think you pretty much agree with me in this audience that if you really want true innovation or gains in productivity, it's pretty close to impossible this day and age uh, to get that productivity gain or innovation in any industry without the use of IT. So you know, just think through medical, think through financial services, think through anything you want. I mean, you need, you need, you need IT. So it's fundamentally, right, right it's, it's the key success factor for everything we do in, in, in more and more in life. And, and what you always do in life, and Joseph talked a little bit, at least what I do, and I think most of you do, is, is you look for just tremendous disruption uh, and where, where the ecosystem's gonna change, and in there's gonna be tremendous opportunity. So it's up to you if you're gonna see when these tectonic plates shift at this magnitude, are you gonna get disrupted by it? And this is every business, I'm not talking about IT, every business, or, or are you gonna ride the opportunistic side of it? But I can assure everybody that for the next 10 years, these are the four macro trends that are gonna drive information technology. Mobility, cloud computing, big data, predictive analytics, real-time predictive analytics, and social networking. And these are all interrelated. Right, we want to we want to act, use any device we want. We want to get our information any place we are. We, we want to do that in more and more in connected social ways. We want to use big data to change our business models, and we need it. We need a different kind of infrastructure to get all that done. On that's called cloud cloud computing. So that's how these these interrelate. I also think there's a critical success factor here, which will gate how fast these this disruption and opportunism comes at us, and that's trust. Right, we need our information to be secure. Uh, there's a first cousin of security called privacy, which I won't get into at all, uh, which people could confuse, but they're very, very different. I think you'd agree with me that rational people can agree on security, but rational people do not agree on what, what I should keep or anybody should keep private. But at any rate, these are the trends, and, these are, and that's the pillars of these, of these trends need to ride on trust. <clears throat> now, this, is, this came from IDC, not me, but they, they talked about IT emerging in three great platforms. So obviously being here in Massachusetts, 
We all remember Platform 1. This was the 128 Miracle, the seat of the mini computer revolution. So mini computers are mainframe. There were 22 companies that had a market cap of over a billion dollars, and a billion dollars in those days was a lot of money. <laughs> and and of the, all of 22, there's only one that made it to the second platform, and that's IBM. So all the others are gone, uh, either totally gone or part of something else, but certainly those great names are, not, are no longer part of us. And, it, and pretty, pretty, with, with a few, ex, few exceptions, uh, the, you know, Massachusetts was not a huge player in the second platform, which was around, uh, you know, the internet and, and, uh, and, and lands and PCs and microprocessors and client-server computing. And what this says is now we're entering the third platform. As you can see by the size of these disks, this is going to dwarf any, other, any of these other platforms. And I, and I told you what these, these are going to be about. Be about. But, but think about it. In our first platform, people use proprietary devices to get to their data, very few of them. So you had only millions of users, and you had only thousands of apps. In the second platform, you now went to hundreds of millions of users, tens of thousands of apps, and then everybody accessed it off a PC. And you kind of had two flavors. You had a you know, laptop, a portable PC, and you had a desktop. And that's what the whole world did for 15 years. Now think of the third platform. We're going to billions of users, billions of users, and millions and millions of apps. I think on the iPhone alone now, there's what, 600,000 apps. So there's going to be millions of apps, both enterprise apps and, and personal apps. And of course, the device of choice there is BYOD, bring your own device. You know, whether it be iOS-based, Android-based, Windows-based still, you know, RIM-based, et cetera, et cetera. And there's going to be more coming, trust me. You know, Samsung is not going to sit at, oh, when they use Android, what you watch this, you watch this play. So there, there's going to be a lot of new devices, a lot of different screen format sizes. So you can see how different this is in terms of scope, scale, and, 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 and disruption and opportunity. So, but when you see these plates change, since we didn't participate, and I'm talking now about Massachusetts, which we all, or the area, which we all love dearly, I assume, being in this room, um, we didn't participate significantly. I mean, obviously, EMC was born there and great success, but if you looked at how much value was created there, Massachusetts got very little of it. So now the plates are changing again. We have an opportunity, and that's why I wanted to talk about is that opportunity. So obviously, what's really you want is how do I use information to change my business model? How do I use software and information to change? My, and it is going to change every business model, period. So you can't talk about information. Let me dimension big data, because you hear big data, and everybody gets it's probably big. So in this industry, we talk about bytes, right? And everybody knows what a byte is. It's a letter, a number, a symbol, right? One character. And then we got megabytes, which is a million. We got gigabytes, which is a billion terabytes, which is a trillion, petabytes, which is a thousand trillion, exabyte, which is a million trillion, and now we're, now we're actually measuring information in zettabytes, which is a billion trillion. It's a one with 22, 21 zeros after it. Now, I read this by, a, you'll see the scientists come up later who did this. They said that's, a, that's exactly equal to the number of grains of sands in all the beaches of the world. And I asked myself, how the hell did I know that? <laughs> I, it's, Jack, could you tell me about it? And I, but that's what they say. So you go to all the beaches in the world, if you can imagine in your mind, that's a zettabyte. And we're producing multiples of these zettabytes. And yes, there's a next thing, it's called the Yodabyte, with, I don't know what that is, but stealing from the uh, MasterCard, priceless, I say unimaginable, I don't know, a lot. But let me mention it for you in another way. In the year 2000, the beginning of this century, right? Not too long ago, 12 years, in a, well, let's call it 12 and a third years ago. In that entire year, there were two exabytes, a one with 18 zeros after it, two of them, that were generated the whole year. Today, every day, we now do four times, more than four times that amount, every day. Is the, you think that's a good change? That's a significant change? Now, if we have all that data, how, do, how can we use that data to change business models? That's, that's what we're talking about. And, there's no, and this is the prediction from these same scientists who did the grain of sand study also, I think. But, and you could see that as, as, they, as, you, as we move through time, uh, this is an exabytes. If you take off the last, so you can, you can call 40 zettabytes. So starting from the beginning to the end, that's, 30, that's, that's over 35 times growth of information this, this decade. 
So just tremendous amount of information come in. And this is held remarkably true. The study was done in 2010, and this year they're predicting just short of four zettabytes, 40 exabytes, or there you go, you got it, lots. So I think you might ask yourself, okay, now I got a dimension on big data, and it, whatever, is it, whatever is in your mind, and what's driving it though? Well, the answer really is, for the most part, it, it's us. So obviously there's now billion smartphones generating all kinds of data. Uh, you can see in YouTube, it's pretty amazing, right? 72 hours of video, right? A video's got over 100 megabytes. 72 hours of video every, every minute, every minute. Like they get, people don't have enough to do in their lives. But anyway, any rate, um, you know, if, if you can see what happens with smart grids, how much more information it takes if you sample, if you sample a house every 15, 15, uh, 15 minutes to understand flows of electric, so how you can make things more efficient. Uh, you can see what happens in an oil rig. You can see what happens in gene sequencing. So again, these, this is what's generating all that data, right? It's, a lot of it is you, and, there's, and I'll talk about another factor too. So yet, if you take an individual business or an enterprise, they use, most decisions today are made from the data that they have themselves, which is a very small portion of the world's data. And most of that decision is being made from data that's structured. Data that's structured is data that goes in a database that you can put in rows and columns. So there's a lot of things like a spreadsheet fits really nicely in rows and columns, and you can add it up columnar, or you can add it across, right? And, or you can do both. And this is how most, inf most companies. The facts are that an individual enterprise have five, times as, have five times as much data, growing three times as fast that's unstructured. What's unstructured data? A video, an email a picture, things that don't fit nicely into a database. So think of what we're doing today as every company, every enterprise, we're making decisions off a small portion of our data, right, which we got all this other data saved, so it must have value, and how do we use both structured and unstructured data? But it doesn't stop there. If you look at the data that our partners have, business partners, like for instance, the cell phone companies have locational data, incredibly valuable for a lot of industries we'll talk about later. Uh, there's credit data, there's forecast data. I mean, there's all kinds of data out there that partners that you can make an agreement with your partners and buy. And then there's publicly available data, such as all that information that's on YouTube. Anybody can grab that to make the t Twitter feeds, right? You saw how the stock market went crazy the other day because they're grabbing now, now these program traders are now grabbing Twitter feeds, interpreting them and making decisions. So anyway, when you get to the right of this, this, this is growing like 10 times as fast as enterprise data. 90% of that is unstructured. So the thing with big data is, how do I get out of the past, the, the, the platform two technology, which I use structured data, right, rows and columns, use my unstructured data, my partner's unstructured data, and all the public data that's available to make better decisions faster. And when my, when my belief here, strong belief, is that is gonna change every single industry, forget IT. And those of us that get on this wave are gonna find it opportunistic, and those of us that deny it, will get disrupted. And, that, and this goes across virtually any industry, and I'll talk about that. But there's another great thing happening, and that's called telemetry. And, and more and more uh, companies are building sensors into every product they make. And now what happens is, <clears throat> and I'll give you some examples coming up, you not only have, you see that I brought up the word not only big, but fast. Because when you do data, it's either mostly with your thumbs these days, right? Or you can type it which is relatively slow because you can see it happening. These machines are gonna start spitting it out at great speeds. So now, if I'm gonna analyze this data in real time, I need great pools of processing power, right, cloud computing, and, he, and I, need to get, I need to ingest this data fast, reason over it, and make a decision. So it's just changing the world. So just a couple of toys I brought with me. And this, this is from the Boston Marathon. Every runner had a sensor on him, and of course they tracked the runner how to, these, this sensor was 96 cents, I'm told. This is a fairly dumb sensor, but it's still a sensor, right? So therefore you can track anybody in the race wherever they are, and in the future this sensor will not only do this, it'll actually start, start kind of examining, if you will, the runner. How's he doing? How's his heartbeat, or her heartbeat? Any problems in their blood flow or whatever, right? And, and we can actually then prevent and, that, and that's just where the world's going. And that sensor will be, that sensor will be a lot of money today. It'll be 96 cents as sure as I'm standing here X years from today. 
This is a cool little product. This is, it kind of looks like the older, this is a, the new thermostat for your house. And what you do is you, you know, you put this on kind of, and you turn it and you, and, and you keep adjusting your house, right? And what it does is it learns your patterns and then it'll do it for you. But of course it's smart, it's, attack, it's, attracted, it's attached to your Wi-Fi at home and then you can adjust it yourself. So if you're going away and, and you have a remote house in, in, in Vermont, Jack, and, uh, and, you want to turn, and you're gonna get there early and you wanna turn up the uh, thermostat, you can do it from your iPhone. Right? This is not very expensive either. But these things are gonna get smarter and smarter. And every, every device that you can imagine is gonna have sensors in it. So at any rate, I, I'm making a case here it's gonna impact every industry. I take, took some of our customers that are, we're working with on interesting things. I'll just take two, two examples. Uh, in retail, what they really wanna do is know where you are in a store. So when you walk in the store with your permission, opt in, they'll know where you are in a the store. They'll have a lot of history of your likes. Therefore, they'll know exactly what aisle you're in. They'll, in the future, they'll know what's in your basket, what you're, what, you, what, you're, what, you're, what you're looking at, and then they will basically suggest and throw coupons and, and suggestions to you as you're shopping. What, what, a different, what a different experience it is in clipping coupons out of the paper or even what Groupon's doing today. This will change retailing. Uh, one of our partners we're working with is GE. And if Jeff Emmelt was here, he'd tell you how he's putting uh, dozens of sensors on a <clears throat> jet aircraft. And what he wants to do now, if anybody that knows anything about planes, you service planes by the hour, right? So every 100 hours, you've got to this one, every 1,000 hours, get, whether it needs it or not. Might need it earlier or later. What this will do, the engine will continually be speaking. And I matter it's spewing out that information. So a transcontinental flight will have over a terabyte of information that's going to accumulate. But just think what that does. It knows exactly what, it's telling you exactly what it needs. So when it goes in to get serviced, it might need service earlier or later. And when it's there, the parts are there, the technician is totally trained on what, what he or she has to do. So you can see how it's gonna transform. And what, and what Jeff wants to do is he wants to sell this power by the hour rather than sell, you, sell say, American Airlines an engine. They'll sell X amount of power and they'll service it and give a better experience. So therefore, having build a better quality engine, having more, so you can just see this going. I got Colin here at the table. You, you attach this to robot, big data to robotics. You can change the world. Colin's from iRobot. You agree? I agree, absolutely. There you go. I'm doing this for free. <laughs> <laughs> now, Joseph, coming to you. There's, gonna, there's a new discipline. I mean, I'm going to age myself now because half of you aren't going to know what the heck I'm talking about. But those of us who are around in the 70s saw a movie called The Graduate. And Dustin Hoffman was standing there and some older guy goes up to him and says, plastics, you know, one word. And if you think about the 70s, that was actually pretty bright, right? Because nothing was, very little was made out of plastic. Now it seems everything's made out of plastic. So today, if you're at that same party, you want to get a young fellow or a young woman just graduating, we'll say, data scientist. Because if you have all this massive amount of data in all these different locations, how do I, how do I reason over this in real time to make better decisions? Because obviously, if I'm going to attack that person, think of that person that's in a particular aisle, I gotta do this now. I can't do this in two minutes, three minutes. I gotta process this and do it now. Same thing with a jet engine. If something goes wrong, you wanna know it now. So at any rate, there's a tremendous opportunity. There's gonna be a, a wicked shortage of data scientists, people who know how to reason over that data and change business models. I'm sorry about this, Joseph, but Harvard Business Review says it's the sexiest job of the 21st century, and with Harvard Business Review, you get anything wrong now. So anyway, I see this as a massive opportunity uh, for Massachusetts, right? When, it, when, when you get this kind of shift and how you, and how you handle this tr kinds of trans trans transformation in any business, right, is gonna define your future. And again, this is, a, uh, this I believe, and Jack and John and a bunch of my colleagues have been working hard on this. I think if Massachusetts really wakes up, uh, we, we, can, we can ride this new third platform of IT really well and maybe make us look like the mass 128 miracle, although it won't be on 128, it'll be more pervasive. Now Joseph talked about this, so I'm gonna talk about it again, but you can see what happens when government, industry, and we did this with Cisco and uh, five great universities now, I think it's up to seven or eight great universities have come together to put this high performance, where they will crunch over huge amounts of data very quickly. I understand they had their first megawatt of power, megawatt of 
capability ready to go. And uh, again, and it's very, and the government did a nice job, and I'm not saying the government's a key indicator, but, I'm, but, but you need to get, get this kind of working together attitude. But again, Bob, here comes at you. Uh, I think what we don't do as well as California does is when government, research universities, big companies, small companies, and venture capital community work together, you know, focusing on entrepreneurialism and how we keep those entrepreneurs here. And this is something we can do a lot better. And we got the chain, and I'm, I'm, so I'm submitting that if we do this better, and, we, and, you, and you believe what I'm saying, that this is a change which is gonna affect every business model of every company in the world, including education, Joseph. What's happening in the education field and online training it's only a matter of time till really good universities, first class universities, start giving actual credits for these online courses, and that's going to change. That's going to change the future of education. And uh, there's some really great studies and great indications that this is happening. So again, this is the ecosystem. Probably, if I was going to be fair, I don't know if somebody from the government will shoot me. They're probably the least important in this whole thing, but important. I think. But if the venture capital community, industry, and research universities could come together, focus on the entrepreneur with the help of government would be great. Uh, we, we could have a great, uh, great comeback. These are some of the areas that are, that are kind of hot in big data from, a, from a, uh, just a research front of view. The top three are more underlying. There's things like artificial intelligence. There's things like crowdsourcing. There's things like machine learning. By the way, those of you that saw Watson play Jeopardy, that's machine learning. Um, for the, the whole, as Jack Connors would tell you, this is going to revolutionize the healthcare field, uh, risk analytics, uh, security. And, and I said I wouldn't talk about EMC, but I want to tell you one thing that we are doing. Uh, we're taking a page from that, and we're changing everything we do in RSA. Because if you look at today's security environment, most of the world was, was built in security to how do I keep the bad guys out? It's kind of like having this moat and guards around a bank, and then when you walk into the bank, all the money's sitting on the middle of the floor, right? So basically, we got to change what's happening inside because Believe me, these sponsored states and even organized crime are so good you cannot keep them out. And, and th these perimeter defenses don't work, so more has got to do with how do I look at every packet flow of information and see does this look right or not? What is a profile for an individual? Can they get this information? Can they send this information there? Can they, can they do this set of activities on that information, yes or no? If it's a no, shut it down. And again, it's big data because you've got to look at huge, massive amounts of data, every packet flow of, of information and make a decision on it right away. And that's kind of where we're driving RSA, which of course is, is here in this, in this area. And yes, and two days ago, three days ago, we just launched a new company called Pivotal, a huge startup, uh, we, which is building a platform for next generation cloud and big and fast data. Uh, as you see, GE got so impressed with what we're doing, they bought 10%. So it's owned 62% from EMC, 28% from VMware. Of course, EMC owns 88% for VMware. And then uh, GE's got 10%. Yeah, we got about 1,250 employees. Uh, it's got 300 million in revenue, and we're gonna. And this has got, already had over a billion dollars of investment, and we'll put uh, at least another half a billion into this over the next couple of years. So again, that's how much we believe that this is going to change the face of the world. And by the way, we gave 12% of this company to the employees, and we will take it public. So, Bob, we're following your uh, good example. So, at any rate, um, that's that's what I wanted to do in my formal remarks. But I do believe this dawn of big data and, and the pervasiveness of this new platform, third platform as I called it, that it is, you know, social networking, mobility, uh, and cloud computing as the underpinning use and architecture for this big data to actually get work at, uh, at rates, at costs that humans can afford, businesses can afford, is, is going to change everything. So thank you for your attentiveness, your great audience. Okay, thank you. Anybody want to ask a question live or tweet? Please use the. Or you, even if you're here, you could tweet. I guess I don't know. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you morning. for your inspiring talk. I'm Pamela Goldberg from the Mass Tech Collaborative, and. I'm also very focused on big data, 
My biggest concern is talent pipeline. Uh, if data scientist is the answer, we tell college graduates, don't we need to tell them sooner than when they graduate college? And how do we prepare enough data scientists to meet the kinds of demands that you're mentioning? Joseph? <laughs> It was for me, but I just gave it to you. But I think you should play a bigger role than me. No, but I, I really do believe it's awareness, right? So, you know, probably uh, John Fish and uh, Jack Connors are probably, hard, you know, kind of tired of me uh, getting on this, on this track, Jack. But I learned from Jack, um, the master, at uh, getting a message out there that you, need, you do need to repeat it uh, and repeat it with vigor and good facts. And uh, so uh, the first step is awareness, that this is this massive opportunity. Uh, the second step is we're, we're, we're doing everything we can from our standpoint, in my personal standpoint, to get, you know, how, Joseph, how many times have I talked to you about this subject, 10, 15? I mean, the school's got to basically say, we need, we need to develop curricula. We're helping, we're actually investing ourselves from our company to, to help schools build these curriculas. This, well, this is a huge shortage. Uh, so, I mean, basically, and then beyond that, it's everything that, you know, uh, the MACP group, which Jack and I and John are a member of, we're, you know, constantly pushing for, you know, edu more education in the STEM field, you know, science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics, right? Because th th those are the backgrounds uh, that you need. But, the, but also you need a very creative background. So it's really an interesting blend of creativity to come up with these new business models and applying sciences uh, to do it. So basically, it's, it's the, the, from down low, the curricula has got to change. They've really got to change. And, it's, and, the, and the, we're going to help, and, but there's no magic wand. But I think if we really work with the best, best and brightest schools, obviously Northeast and near and dear to my heart, uh, we're going we're to make a big difference. And that, that's, what's so, that's what I think is so opportunistic for this area, because what area has uh, the set of educational learning that we have here? I mean, just tremendous, just, you know, it's the second to none in the world. So if we can't do it here and produce these great new data scientists, and believe me, which is going to be a really interesting blend of creativity. Some of these people I meet are really incredibly creative. So it's how do you get some left brain and some right brain people to really come together. And, uh, and it's a fascinating challenge, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really going to have to happen in our, in our education system. We're going to have to turn out different kinds of, of students. And, uh, but again, we have a lot of the basic basic tools right now. Colin, what do you think? You, you're <clears throat> one step closer than I am, probably. Oh, I, I Colin, what do I do? Oh, okay. I had a question, too. But um, now, STEM education is a huge challenge, and, and uh, we do have to start earlier. I, I uh, recently saw a statistic saying that 80% of middle schools in Massachusetts don't have a dedicated science teacher. So science is being taught by whoever in the school can teach it, like the gym teacher, or there is no science program. So, you know, if you look at where does the drop-off start, it's, it's right there in middle school. We got to hit them. The, I know Steve Vinter at, uh, from Google is working on trying to get a computational thinking curriculum started at an earlier um, point in education. And so it's, it's the fact that kids go into middle school 90 plus percent excited by science, they leave middle school 20 percent excited. And that's, that's huge, that's a challenge, and something that we as business leaders need to uh, try to figure out to address. Before you ask your question, I think one thing we can all do, uh, we're having a great debate uh, in Congress down in D.C. on immigration reform. Uh, and if you go to these great schools, the, the kids that are getting, I call them kids, the kids that are getting these advanced degrees, masters, PhDs, 50, almost 50 percent are uh, international students and we're sending them back. And that is just absolutely crazy. Now I understand, you know, kind of the trade-off is how do we get a broad-based immigration policy and fix that, but what, we, what we're doing is, is just a sin. Uh, just a, just re, it's re, absolutely ridiculous. Yes. And uh, that needs to be fixed. So if, we're, we, if there's ever a chance to get both fixed together, it's now. So whatever you can all play a part with your congressmen and senators to say, hey, this is ridiculous. 
Um, and, but one's being held hostage for the other. It's not that anybody on either side of the aisle disagrees. Uh, there is disagreement on if we just do that and without fixing immigration, uh, there's, there's a big group of people who think that's also a sin. So I'm not going to fight it. I'm saying let's do both, but let's do both quickly because we're sending home half the people that could solve this problem. Half the people. Yeah. Go ahead, Colin. So um, my question, my favorite slide in your deck was your, your three-tier slide. And the favorite part of that three-tiered slide was the fact that that third tier, that big disc, was ours to own if we do the right things. And so I was, as someone who has been through tier one, where we did very well, tier two, where Massachusetts fell down, and this tremendous opportunity to lead the nation, lead the world in mobile, cloud, big data, social. Uh, do you have any uh, insights or thoughts on how we hold on to this great opportunity that we are faced with and, and win and become, have Massachusetts lead the nation in that area and avoid yeah. what happened previously? I think Colin, in a very nice way, said I was old. Because I started in, in, in platform one, and that's all there was when I started. So I've seen all three, but since I've seen all three acts, right, uh, you know, what advice would I have? Um, but, you know, I'll come, back to the, I'll come back to what I said at the end. I mean, it's, it's really how do you, it's, it's big, big business isn't going to solve it, or business isn't going to solve it. The VC community is not going to solve it. The universities aren't going to solve it, and certainly government's not going to solve, solve it. But if we all come together, we can solve it because we got so much talent. And the big thing is a lot of these startups, you know, were, the seeds were here, you know, companies as big as Microsoft, companies as big as Facebook, the feed, seeds were here, and then they moved because there's a perception that that's where the talent is, that's the environment where I could live in. And, and then, of course, they got something we'll never have, uh, except for maybe four months a year, which is great weather. Um, <laughs> so. We got to, before the kids find out about the great weather, we, <laughs> you know, we got to do more to keep them here. And I think uh, that's where the government can, you know, increase innovation centers. Um, John Fish and I were talking to the mayor recently. Uh, it was very receptive to helping. Uh, I think the university's got to change their programs. Uh, I think undergraduately, as you said, we got to do much more in the math and sciences. Um, so I just got to keep at it, but I mean, I think that's that's why I took my time today and to to make to do this awareness and why I re, why I repeat this message. I think it's all of us if we band together, you know, we we can make a difference. But it's it's not one there's no one bullet, Colin. I, I don't see one magic bullet. It's just, but you got to have a will and you got to have a recognition. You got to want to do it. And uh, I've decided, you know, at my I've been very fortunate in life, and at my uh, at my age now, it's one of the things I want to do is give back. And this is along with my good friends Jack and, and John, uh, it's one of the things we decided to really focus on and make a difference and be a bit of a pain in the neck. You know, because if I aggravate somebody, I really don't care at my age. So, uh, you know, I'm willing to aggravate the government, I'm willing to aggravate Joseph, you know, and it's just kind of my lot in life, you know. Uh, and, and I think if we make enough noise, and, you know, I could do a very small part, but I think collectively, when you look at the power and the, uh, and the, and the credibility of this room, we can make a difference. Yes. My name is Priscilla Douglas, and we just saw last week the use of unstructured data to make, a, to make that case. I'm wondering, I'd like to hear your comments on privacy, surveillance, and, and how all this is going to come together. What do you see? Well, I, I said in my comments that, you know, rational people, I, I would bet pretty, pretty, pretty good money and give you some odds, that if I said, okay, let's talk about security of information, we'd have a pretty good consistency. Uh, but again, uh, across different age groups, across different uh, kind of liberal versus more conservative in life, you, you don't always agree on privacy, right? You know, uh, one of the, Jack will tell you one of the things wrong with healthcare is we don't share experiences and build enough best practices. And, and that gets held up in, in the confines of privacy, because it's my medical information, I won't share it. 
But for the life of me, I can't understand why every medical procedure that everybody happens, if we have a trusted source that my name is going to be, and my, my direct information is going to be completely scraped off, why can't they share what, what treatments I had, what pills I took, right? And what my experience was. And that way we can develop best practices. So that's what's, but that's privacy. But, pri but the fact that we can't agree on privacy, we can't get that done. Sounds very rational. So uh, privacy is going to be a hard thing to tackle. Uh, security is actually easy to tackle privacies, but they always come together, right, because they're related. So, uh, and, and, and people don't agree. And so it's just going, going to be a long slug, unfortunately. Um, but uh, I think ultimately, uh, what's going to happen is going to be, you know, more and more areas are going to be opt-in, opt-out. So in other words, if you walk into that store and you say, hey, I'm opting in, you can, everybody notice when you're getting on a, um, any kind of app today, you're getting asked two questions. You know, can I have access to your calendar? Yeah. Is it okay if I use your geographic location? You, got, you all notice that? Yeah. Why are they asking that? But, that, but again, you, you can opt in, yes or no. Now, I guarantee you why I said it's different is I almost always say no, right? But I guarantee you my grandkids will almost always say yes, <laughs> right? And, I, and I, 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 may, I always make a joke that I don't understand some of the kids today because I went to, I was not a great kid. I, I, was, I think I was a good kid, but I, did, I was a little bit wild. And uh, I went to great lengths to hide some of the things that I did <laughs> from my parents. And now they put it on Facebook and the kids think their parents don't read Facebook. I don't understand it. But, but again, uh, the young will opt in all the time. Uh, but we got to get on, on some of these things around healthcare, we got to get more people opt in. And I think the way it's going to work out is if you don't opt in, your rates are going to go up ultimately. Right? And we got to get a trusted source to say, I, I have no problem with you having my medical information, but you can't attach it to me. And, you get, and to do that, you need trust. So you kind of got three things. You got privacy, you got trust, and you got security. All of which are important, but they interrelate, and, and, it's, and it's tough to get action on any of them because different factions of Congress, different, different uh, you know, well-meaning groups put pressures on different areas, and we're just not making as much progress. But, but again, it's got to be around opt-in, opt-out. And, uh, and again, ultimately, when they want you to opt-in, you know, you're going to get better treatments or better rates when you, when you do opt in on certain things that are rational. And that's, that's the way it's going to go eventually. But it's going to take us a long time to get there, unfortunately. But you're right. I mean, if you looked at some of the capabilities that they had using all unstructured data and the way they tracked down those two suspects was rather miraculous. That could not have happened X years ago, right? I mean, I was, I was in London recently, and uh, it was a pretty, pretty clever ad on, this, on the store window, and it says, um, you will, be, uh, you will be captured on video 52 times today. How are you dressed? <laughs> and it was, it was a men's store. I said, that's pretty clever. <laughs> but just think of that. I mean, they're t they're, I don't know if that's the right statistic or not, but they said you're going to be on video 52 times today, right? Uh, and that's not wrong, right? And, and this technology gets better and better. Okay. Mr. Tucci, this question comes from Twitter. As big data transforms businesses across industries, what dangers do you see for companies that are slow to embrace it? I think companies are going to be, you know, if you think of retail, right, just think of what Amazon has done to retail, right? It's not the fact that they're online, it's the software that they've built. I mean, if, if you go on Amazon and order anything, they've learned about you, and they're going to continually come at you and suggest. Or if you go to a, a classic store and you fill up your shopping, they don't know anything about you until you, you check out. And if you paid with cash, they never know anything about you, right? So just think of the, how they're changing right now. If, you, if you're a bank and you're getting in payments, think of what PayPal's doing. Think of what Square and Square D is doing, you know, the way they swipe. I mean, these are going to disrupt. So if you don't think, if, if you don't believe every, and I tell you, Joseph, we talk about it at our, at our trustee meetings, you know, online education is only a matter of time to really first-class universities give credits, and that's going to change the scope of education. 
So it's going to be every industry. You know, Jack could tell you chapter and verse of how technology is changing healthcare and what could get, and what could get done. So it's, ju it's just going to happen. So it's, it, those that deny are going to lose, right? And you can't see it as, if, if you view it as a threat, you know, you, you, you're, you're looking through a half empty glass. You've got to say, what's the opportunity for me? And then you be better, you know, act as if you're a bit on fire and how you're going to move faster, right? You know, not, you know, there's no need to panic. Every, there's plenty of time, but you've got to move faster. But every industry is, is, is going to have a set of disruptions coming at it. Now, virtually every industry is going to have a set of disruptions coming at it that if they don't adapt this technology, uh, you know, we'll lose. I'm getting the hook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We have time for one more question on a global level. I guess it's coming from you, Obed. <laughs> How are we positioned on a global level? Oh, I think terrific. I really do. I mean, if, if you, it, the great part about the U.S., and this is not going to last forever, especially if we keep sending these bright students home, but right now we are the seat of innovation in everything that's happening on that third platform. If there was, uh, you know, a thousand meaningful companies, you know, we have 998 or something like that. So we're in, a, we're in a great spot. But again, we should never think, I mean, the Chinese are incredibly innovative and incredibly hungry. Um, and, there's, and, there's, and they're graduating far more engineers than we do. Same thing with India, you know, and you go on and on. So if we get complacent, but we're in great shape, great shape. Joe, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you everybody. Appreciate it. Stay tuned with you. Thank you.